Buster Sores was pastor of First Baptist Church in Lincoln Garden, Somerset, New York. Uh, and Buster shared his story with his congregation and shared it with everyone else now who's heard that story. Before Buster was saved, he was involved with drugs and um, he dealt drugs and took drugs and in that type of lifestyle. When one night, uh, there were five drug dealers that caught him, kidnapped him in a sense, and threw him in the back of a car, took him to, you know, it's kind of like something you see out of The Godfather, took him to a vacant lot, and they were going to kill him. It was a guy stuck a forty-five in the back of his head. Another guy stuck a shotgun in his face. And then a, a third guy stuck a rifle into his side. Uh, but before they could pull the triggers and kill Buster, they saw a police car driving, a cruiser, off in the distance driving, and they they talked among themselves. They said, if we shoot all of this, it, listen, they're going to hear this. They're going to turn around. It's going to be bad. We're going to get out of here. And they looked at Buster and they said, hey, we're coming back for you. Don't forget it. We're coming back. They left. Buster got up just, you know, out of the terror of a moment like that, and he just ran. Well, in the months after that, Buster came to Jesus Christ. An event like that tends to have a and an impact on your life, doesn't it? Well, he came to Christ. And uh, in that coming to Christ, God not only saved him, but God called him to ministry. And uh, so he surrendered to the ministry, and he thought, well, all my life is past. It's back behind me. It's been forgiven by Christ. He said, I'll never see those guys again. Well, one night he was going to see the Knicks play at Madison Square Garden there in New York City, and he was in a crowd of some 20,000 people when he came face-to-face with the guy that had held the 45 to the back of his head. Buster said, I didn't know what, he said, I just panicked. He said, I didn't know what to do. He said, I didn't have a clue what he was going to, was he going to pull out a gun? Because the guy always had a gun. Is he going to pull out a gun and shoot me? Is he going to pull out a knife and stab me? Is he going to grab me? Are the other guys here? Buster said, before I could think about what, what was going to happen to me, he said, I just grabbed him and hugged him and looked at him and said, in Jesus, I love you. (laughs) And he said, if you ever need me to do anything for you, don't ever hesitate to call me. I'm always here, friend. And he said, with that, he said the guy was stunned, so stunned he didn't even move. And Buster walked on off. Now you hear those kind of unbelievable stories. I talked to a guy this week that I pastored for 12 years who flew quaaludes for the syndicate. Now, this guy's got incredible testimony. I, I've preached, and he's shared his testimony before at m- many gatherings. His name's Wayne. Here's some Cindy and them from Jacksonville. You remember Wayne? Had his ear, he shot his ear off in an airplane. You know, shooting a gun in an airplane is not a good thing to do. But they were trying to kill him, and uh, Wayne said that he was flying these quaaludes, and he'd been somewhere down in the Caribbean, and, and he said the police were behind him. Uh, they were flying a small plane. He was in a, like a, you know, a Cessna, a single engine plane. They were following him, trying to track, try to catch him. And he said that night before he left, he had hired some guys. And he said, we went out with machetes. And he says, we, we destroyed that, that airplane. I hope I'm not telling something's going to get him in trouble with the FBI. But anyway, it, it's him. Anyway, so um, he, he uh, said, we destroyed that, that plane. And he said, they tried to pin this on me and caught one of the guys and he said, when I got a hold of the guy, I told him, I said, you, you want to fall into the hands of the police. You don't want to fall into my hands. You say anything. He said, I shot at the guy. He said, not to kill him, but to scare him. He said, then I beat him up and left him and said, you'd better not say anything. Well, Wayne gets saved not long after that. Wayne comes to Christ and Wayne says, I got to go and find this guy and apologize to him, ask him to forgive me, share with him the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So he sent word by these guys that, you know, that knew him. And the guy said, it's a trap. It's a trap. Don't listen to him. Don't tell him where I am. It's a trap. He's trying to kill me. Well, Wayne eventually gets to the guy and looks at him and tells him the same thing. In Jesus Christ, I've been forgiven. And I come to ask your forgiveness for shooting at you and beating you up. and uh, All the stuff that I did to you. And uh, he's, you know, I don't know what the guy did. I'm just listening to Wayne as I'm driving. And Wayne said, yeah, I've had to go and tell folks how sorry I I've, I've, was for things that I've done and apologize and get forgiveness and all of that. Now, you hear that with drug dealers. Why don't we hear that around the church? In the very place where everybody claims one experience, I've been forgiven. 
Why do we not hear stories, incredible stories of people forgiving one another and people extending forgiveness? Why in the place where we claim that Jesus Christ has forgiven us of all of our sin, can we not experience and express forgiveness to one another? Well, that's exactly what Paul is talking about in that little epistle called Philemon. If you've got your copy of God's Word, I want you to go there with me this morning. And I want you to look at this, and as you're going to Philemon, let me give you the five things that I shared last week in case I didn't get to all of those, but I want to share them with you again. What happens when we are unforgiving, when we will not forgive? Well, let me tell you, uh, five things begin to take place in your life, in a church or in a person's life. First of all, unforgiveness will hold you hostage. Now listen to that again and think about that with me. Number one, unforgiveness will hold you hostage to a past event. It'll hold you hostage to another person. I think the best way I ever heard that was by Nelson Mandela, who said that unforgiveness is like drinking poison, thinking the other person is going to die. Let me give you the second thing, and the second thing is this. Uh, It produces bitterness in your life. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 of Hebrews talks about this very thing, this root of bitterness that will grow up in your life. Unforgiveness will do that. And according to Hebrews, unforgiveness does something unusual. If you study some of these things through Scripture, you'll you'll detect that certain sins have certain consequences. Bitterness always stains whatever it gets on. And the writer of Hebrews said, listen, you be careful that bitterness doesn't get in because you will stain everybody around you. Number three, the third thing is it gives Satan an opportunity. Unforgiveness in your life is a door through which Satan will walk in and will take control over an area of your life. Number four, it will interfere with your relationship with God. Here's your homework, Matthew chapter 18. Let me give you that again, Matthew 18. Go read that. Listen carefully to what Jesus says in that passage about unforgiveness. And number five, the fifth thing is this, it will wreck your witness and ruin your testimony. Unforgiveness in your life will wreck your witness and it will ruin your testimony. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about the fact that you've experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. A life, listen, a life that experiences the forgiveness power of Jesus Christ becomes a witness to that life-changing power. Now, let me give you that again. A life that experiences the life-changing power of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ becomes a witness to that life-changing power. When you've experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in your life, you can't help but be a witness for that. It becomes just part of who you are. You've experienced it, and you cannot help but show it. And that's what I want you to see in verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. And watch this. I'm going to begin, and I'm going to start with verse 4. And I want you to see that forgiveness, listen, a life of forgiveness expresses the love of Christ to others. When you've experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, you just express that love of Christ to other people. Now, Paul begins, verse 4, and he says this, I thank my God always. Now, I I shared with you last week that uh, I personally believe that Colossians was written. Paul is in prison in Rome. He writes Colossians. Then he pulls out another piece of parchment, and he writes this little epistle to Philemon. Well, I also shared with you, these are two Roman, uh, these are two uh, of what we call the prison epistles. There are two more. One is Philippians and one is Ephesians. And according to Dr. Charles Ryrie, all four of these were written in the year 61 when Paul was in prison in Rome, this first Roman imprisonment. This is not when he's going to die. He'll be released, then he'll be imprisoned a second time, and then he will be uh, executed by Nero. He is in prison now, and he writes this. So he writes Philippians, he writes Ephesians, he writes Colossians, he writes Philemon. And if you go back to Ephesians, do you remember what he said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29? Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only a word such as is edifying, that builds up. 
He says, don't let anything negative, anything derogatory, anything that hurts come out of your mouth. No unwholesome word. But he says, let words come out of your mouth that build other people up. Look at what he's doing. He said that. He preached that. Now look at what he's doing. He's actually doing it. He writes to Philemon. He says, I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers. He says, uh, Philemon, I, I just want you to know I'm thankful for you. And he says, I'm thankful for you because, look at verse 5. This is why. Because, that's the conjunction right there. Because of these things right here. Now, I'm going to get a little technical as far as grammar goes in verse 5. But just stick with me because you're going to see what Paul is doing and what he's saying here. Because I hear. Now, I thank my God. That's a present tense verb right there. I thank. I hear. That's in verse 5. That's a present tense. And what it's saying is this, is I thank God, I thank God, I thank God. It's not ending. It's present tense. It's always, it's always taking place. I thank God. Every time I think uh, uh, of praying and I begin to pray, I thank God for you, Philemon. And he says, every time I hear something about you, this is what I hear. I'm hearing this constantly. I'm not getting mixed reports, but I'm hearing of this. Now, he says, I'm hearing two things. Number one, I'm hearing about your love and your faith. Do you see that right there? Because I hear of your love and the faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. He says, that's what I'm hearing. Now, where does he hear this from? A guy by the name of Epaphras. Um, Epaphras is here. Epaphras was a guy who lived in Colossae. And in fact, do this. Put your finger right there in Philemon. Go back to Colossians chapter 1 and look at this in verse 7. He tells the church there at Colossae, you learned this, what, what he's just said. You learned this from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant. He calls him a fellow prisoner who is faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in this man. That's where he's hearing it from. Epaphras came from Colossae, and he said, let me tell you about the love of the church, but let me tell you about Philemon, and let me tell you this guy is a guy who's living out his faith and a guy who loves the saints. He is pastoring the saints. He loves the church that meets in his house. He's pastoring the church that meets in his house. Now, I've got to take a break right here. Don't confuse Epaphras from Colossae with Epaphroditus from Ephesus. No, from Philippi. He's from, Epaphroditus is from Philippi, and Epaphras is from Colossae, and Aristarchus is from Thessalonica. Don't confuse them, because they're all there with Paul in prison. They're all running back and forth, and they're going to Rome into the prison, and that's what he, call, he calls Epaphroditus this, he calls Aristarchus this, and he calls Epaphras this. They are my fellow um, prisoners because they decided, listen, these churches loved Paul so much that when Paul went to prison, each of these churches took somebody and said, we're going to pay all your expenses. Don't worry about it. You just go sit with Paul while he's in prison. Now, if they come and arrest me, I'm going to watch and see who shows up (laughs) because I'm convinced at some point before it's all said and done with, preachers are going to be arrested. I just, listen, see also Canada last year. Well, let me tell you, they came and they sat with him and they ministered to him. Luke was there, his physician, but they were all there ministering to him. And that's where Paul is getting information. They would probably shift off. I'm going to go back. Aristarchus, I'm going back to Thessalonica. You guys stay here. for When I come back, you can go back to Colossae, Epaphras. And when Epaphras comes out, he says, hey, this is Epaphroditus. You can go back to, to um, Philippi. And uh, you go back there and stay, you know, and I'll stay with him while you're gone. So they're all doing that. So that's where he's hearing from these churches. That's where he's getting these reports. And he says, every time I hear about you, I hear two things. Now think about every time people talk about you, what do they say about you? Well, at Philemon, they were saying this, this guy has got a real faith and this guy loves the church. He loves the people. Not the organization, he loves the people. Now just look at this, and let me show you something in the text. Because there is a literary construction here that is going off that they would catch in Greek. Watch this. It's called a chiastic construction. 
And I'm going to explain it, and, it, and I, I'm doing this for a reason. Look at what he says. Because I hear of your love, okay, so we put love here, and of the faith, we put faith there, and you, that you have toward the Lord Jesus, we put the Lord Jesus Christ here, and then toward all the saints, and we put the saints. That's called a chiastic. Now, I know this thing was working a minute ago, so come on. This thing's got a demon. It just will not work. It works every other time, but right here. Here we go. You see that X? It, it would stretch out to each way so that love goes with all the saints and faith goes with the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's written this right here in a chiastic construction to draw attention to these two things and what's taking place. Now, you don't pick it up because... You know, you're not looking at it in the Greek text, and we're not trained for this kind of thing. We pick up something that rhymes. I'm a poet and didn't know it. You know, we pick up, right? okay, well, it's right. Or it's a literal, you know, alliterative. You know, petunias, pretty petunias, on whatever, with another P. You understand. So you understand the device, right? What I'm saying, this is something they would immediately pick up on. The love would go with all the saints. The faith would go with the Lord Jesus Christ. So he comes and he says this. He says, your faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a genuine faith. It's not a Sunday morning for three hours kind of deal. It's not something you have on Sunday morning, and then when you go to work, it's something else. With you, you're a, you're a different person, and when you go home, you're a different person, and when you're with the guys out at the golf course, you're somebody else, and then when you get to church on Sunday morning, oh, yes, you're a man of faith. Now, Philemon was a man of faith 24-7, made no difference where he was. And he was a faith that was grounded and rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he comes and he says, you have a love for all the saints. That is, you know that word, it's agape. Every Baptist is familiar with that word. It's the kind of love that God has for us in Jesus Christ. It's the kind of love that God looks at us and he says, you're lost, you cannot save yourself, uh, you are utterly helpless and hopeless, but I care more about you than I do myself, so I will come, go to a cross, die on a cross, pay the penalty for your sin because I love you that much. That's that kind of love. That's what he's talking about. You have this sacrificial kind of love that puts the brothers and sisters in the fellowship first. Now, as he comes and he says that, he says, that's your witness. You've experienced the love of God. You've put your faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that, your love and your faith in Christ is the witness. That's who you are. Now, we've just looked at the fruit of the Spirit, love. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, all of those we've just looked at. I think when, when he says that, he is basically saying, you are exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And uh, that fruit of the Spirit is going to be expressed eventually by his forgiveness of Onesimus. But now hold on to that for just a minute. He says, this isn't a feeling for you. This isn't an emotion for you, the love of all the saints. He says what this is, this is who you have become. Do you understand that's what the fruit of the Spirit is all about? It's not about what you feel. It's about who you are becoming in Jesus Christ. And he says to Philemon, Philemon, listen, this is who you are. You're a man who's put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and because of that, now you love all the saints. And uh, in doing that, listen, you're going to have the power to do something that we are not able to do in and of ourselves. Now, that's what that grammatical device is doing right there. Now, watch this. Before you can have the love of all the saints, you've got to first have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying in that construction. If you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are able to love all of the saints. Now listen to what, listen to what John says in 1 John chapter 3. 
I believe it is. Listen, listen, to what he, listen to what he says right there. He comes and he says this. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. You know you are saved because you love the brethren. We've passed out of death into life. He who does not love abides in death. In other words, he says, if you don't love the brethren in Christ, you're dead. Now, that's, John, that's not Mac. That's John. That's what John says. And he's telling us in that construction, in that literary device, Paul is saying, your love for the saints comes out of your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to broaden that in just a moment. But he says, that's our witness. I don't know if you remember, I, I do, um, a, a basketball player by the name of James Jones. Because back in the 2000s, we were in Dallas, and we were going to Mavericks games, and it was so much fun. That was the, that was the only time I really ever kept up with the NBA. There was a guy drafted, and I'm trying to remember what year he was drafted, James Jones, University of Miami, and he was, all right, Willis, that's your school. When was he drafted? He went second in the draft to Indiana, Indiana, the Pacers. He went to the Pacers, great basketball player. He left there and he went to, he came back to the Miami Heat. And he played in Miami for a number of years. And then he finished out his career in Phoenix with the Suns. And uh, he, then he went to work for the organization. James Jones was a very outspoken Christian, which is why you don't hear a whole lot about him. Because I want you to listen to what he says. He said this, my desire is to live out my faith in such a way that people can see Jesus Christ in me. He said, I love people. Whoever I come in contact with, I just try to dis display and express God's love to them. Now that is exactly, it's as if James Jones came to this and he got it right out of Philemon. That's exactly what he's saying right there. He's saying when you love and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then to love people is just the natural outflow of what happens. That's your witness, that's your testimony, and people will know it. That is, the city of Birmingham ought to be talking when they talk about love and forgiveness the city of Hoover, the city of Pelham, Chelsea, everywhere around here, when they say, if you want to see what love and forgiveness is like, get on Valleydale Road, drive down there to that hill, look up on that hill, and those people up there are the ones who can show you what it's like. Amen. That's what it ought to be. We are the people who demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. And in demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ, it shows our faith and it shows our forgiveness of others. Now, I can tell y'all are all worked up. Just hold on. Let me, let me move on to the next thing here. You're going to express that love. You're going to express that forgiveness. The second thing is this, is a forgiven life enriches the body of Christ. Now, that's what he comes to now when he comes in verse 6. The first part of verse 6, he says this, I pray that the fellowship of your faith. Now, let me just stop with that for a minute. He's talking about the fellowship of your faith, the koinonia of your faith. What's he talking about? He's talking about the operation of your faith in the midst of the fellowship of God's people. Now listen to me carefully. You can join the church and be lost. I, I mean, you can tell me, I, I don't know, I can't see your heart. You know, and I'm not the ultimate judge anyway, I can promise you that. I'm going to have to stand before the ultimate judge but uh, you, you, can, you can join a church and be lost. There are plenty of lost people on the rows of the church. I have plenty of them. This church, every church that there is. But let me tell you what you can't do. You cannot be lost and have genuine fellowship. That's impossible. It's an impossible thing. So what, what Paul is saying here is this, is that you have a genuine faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, because of that genuine faith in Jesus Christ, you are put into the fellowship of God's people. That's why you are in church. You're not here because I've got an incredible personality. You're not here because I have an unbelievable message. You're not here because I am a tremendous orator. You're not here because all the staff in this place are just such charismatic personalities. 
you are placed in the body of Christ, in the fellowship of God's people, because you have faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why so many people that come into a church that don't have faith in Christ get irritated, upset, uneasy when they sit in church like this. And I get to see it. (laughs) So he says this, you've got a genuine faith. And he says, God has placed you in the fellowship. Literally, the church was in the home of Philemon. It was there. And he says this about his faith in the middle of that fellowship. He says, I'm praying that the fellowship of your faith may become, now, that's an er- it's a constantive heiress is what it is. And you say, well, why do you tell us that? I say this because a constantive heiress speaks of a past event that looks at the whole of everything. So he's looking that it may become, it, it happened, you put your faith in Christ back here, but the whole of your life is that it is becoming active. You see what it says there? Effective, in air gaze, energy, that your Faith in the fellowship is becoming, the whole of it is becoming more and more and more effective, full of energy, more energy, more vitality, that it's growing deeper, that it's growing wider, that your faith is, listen, it is being activated there in the fellowship. That's what he's saying. He comes to Philemon And this letter is being read in front of the entire church. And Paul is saying, Philemon, he says, your faith in the fellowship there, I'm praying that it is going to become more energetic and more energetic and more energetic. It's not laying out of church. It's not taking vacation from church. It's not getting a hiatus from church. It is growing in what it is producing in the body. You are to, through your gifts and your abilities, to enrich the body of Christ here. You are not to do less work year by year. You are to be more and more involved as you are growing in your faith. And you say, when a pastor, why aren't we growing in our faith? I'm going to read you something. I didn't do this in the last hour. Uh, because the Lord didn't call it to my mind, but he has now. I want you to listen to something. There's a great book. You ought to go buy this book. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It is as convicting a book as I've read in the last five, six, seven years. I'm going to go over this. All of the staff have read this. They are now acting like angels, and so when we go uh, on retreat, it's going to be a joy uh, tomorrow. We're going to have a couple of days of retreat. We're going to literally go through. I'm going to, tomorrow morning, about 9.30 or 10 or so, uh, I'm going to go through this book with, with the staff. I want you to listen to this. We, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It's not that we have anything against God or depth or spirit. We would like these. It is just that we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar. We are more busy than bad. You aren't bad. We're just busy. More distracted than non-spiritual. It's not that you're non-spiritual. It's that you're so distracted and more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, the shopping mall, and the fantasy life they produce in us than we are in church. Pathologically, busyness, distraction, and relentlessness are major blocks to our spiritual life. Have you ever stopped to think that your schedule is killing you spiritually? And you say, well, what do I do? Take more time off? No, manage your time wiser. Wiser. By stopping and allowing God to set your agenda. And your spiritual life comes before t-ball or soccer or anything else. That stuff's going to burn up one day. Your spiritual life will not. 
it will live on. And we struggle with how do I do these things? How do I, how do I accomplish that? Listen to what he says. I'm praying that your faith in the fellowship of God's people would become more effective. I've led this year. I'll lead even greater next year because I am committing myself to the spiritual aspect of my life. That's what he's saying. Listen, to Philemon right here. Now, you, you say, well, now what areas are you talking about? Teaching? You're talking about playing in the orchestra? Are you talking about singing? Yes, to all of those. But, but Paul has given you the context of everything he's saying in this book. What is the context of Philemon? If y'all don't want me to break down just sobbing up here, somebody better say it. Forgiveness. This book is about what? Forgiveness. So when Paul comes and he says, I pray that your faith in the midst of the fellowship becomes more effective. Do you know what he's talking about? Philemon, I want you to be more forgiving tomorrow than you have been today. Why? Because Onesimus, your slave, who stole from you and ran away from you, is here in Rome, and lo and behold, he's come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he's coming back home to you. Now, I don't know how it happened, but I just often wonder if Onesimus, he heard Paul preaching, he gets saved, and there he, just like Epaphras and Epaphroditus, and Aristarchus are all down there in the prison uh, with Paul, down in this dungeon with Paul, and he's down there, and Paul is discipling Onesimus, and Onesimus at some point looks up in Paul, and he says, i got to go back. And Paul says, yeah, yeah. Well, he's liable to beat me. Yeah, yeah, but i got to go back. Yeah. He may even kill me. Yep, yep, yep. But I got to go back. Yep, 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 yep. It's going to be difficult going back. Yep, yep, yep. So Paul hears from Onet. He knows the struggle, and he knows what might await him going back legally. But he writes Philemon, and he says, Philemon, in the fellowship of God's people, I'm praying that your forgiveness is going to grow greater and greater and greater. Boy, he is setting this dude up, is he not? <laughs> Let me give you the third thing. And the third thing is this, forgiven. A forgiven life experiences the deepening work of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just give you this. This is, to me, one of the richest little several verses in the New Testament. Just listen to what he says. Verse 6, how do I do that? How can my forgiveness, I've got someone I just cannot get over this thing. I cannot forgive. It was too hurtful. It was too deep. It was too dark. What am I supposed to do? Through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. How is my forgiveness, how am I able to grow in my forgiveness of people? How am I able to extend forgiveness of people? He comes and he says, this is how it starts. Through the knowledge of the knowledge of what? Through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. It's my knowledge of Christ. Now listen, Second Peter. I want you to listen to what Peter says. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, do you hear what Peter is saying? Peter is saying this. He has granted us everything we need to live the Christian life. Oh, I struggle in the Christian. Well, I do too, brothers and sisters. I do too. He said, but listen, I cannot deny Scripture, and Scripture tells me God has provided everything I need to live this Christian life. Somebody's hurt me. I can't forgive them. Listen, I can't get over it. I can't get beyond it. I can't think of anything else. Every time I see them, it's all I think about. Listen, God's word tells me he's given me everything I need. Well, you know, maybe he did, but it ran out of, of power. 
No, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you have an abundance for every good deed. Nope, supply is not an issue with God. It's always there. And you say, well, why in the world do we not get this? I'm going to tell you why. Because we are too busy in our lives than to drill down and to tap into the resource that God has put in us. God's put a resource in every one of you that call him Lord of your life. What we're not doing is we're not drilling down. You see this? Y'all have seen this picture before. Picture of guys down there drilling. They're out in the Gulf, uh, off uh, off, uh, shore in the Gulf of Mexico, drilling. They go down hundreds and thousands of feet. And that drill bit right there, you see that drill bit right there? It's going to penetrate shale. It's going to penetrate rock. It's going to go down until it hits a deposit. When it hits a deposit, what's it going to do? All that oil is going to come gushing back up out of that thing until they can cap that deal off and they've hit what they're looking for. They've got oil. They've got resources. It's down there. That's what the knowledge of the knowledge of Jesus Christ is the drill bit that goes down through the hardness of your life and hits the resources that the Holy Spirit has already put in there. What are we not doing? We're not drilling. You say, well, how do I do that? Get in the word. Find God's will for your life. Pursue what Jesus Christ has for you and listen to the Lord and find his will here for your life. That's Walk closer with Jesus today. Live closer to the Lord today. Let everything about Christ have the overarching say of all of your life. That's drilling down so that when I drill down, I hit the resource. Now, listen to what he's saying. He's saying this. You're going to hit. If you do that, you're going to hit the resources that are forgiveness that the Holy Spirit has put down in there. And you know what what happens when you hit that resource of forgiveness down in your life? You're going to gush forgiveness. You're just not going to forgive this old boy over here. You're going to forgive this one, this one, this one, this one. You're just going to start forgiving everybody. All of this is just going to come up out of your life. Let me tell you something. You forgive that one person that is the hardest to forgive right now in your life, and you will discover you've got forgiveness galore. Jiminy Cricket, if y'all were Pentecostal, y'all would be just running around this place right now. That's a word. That's not what we're doing. We're not doing that. But the resources are there. It's there. And Paul says, listen, I see it gushing out of your life, Philemon. He says, you've hit it. You're doing this through the knowledge of every good work which is in you for Christ Jesus. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love. He's saying, I'm seeing love gush out of you because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. He says, Philemon, when you walk through the church, people are not relieved when you leave. They are refreshed when you come by. Let me just ask you, what is it like when you show up? You show up to a class. Listen, that's what ought to be happening in every life group right there. Every life group right there, that's what ought to be happening. You got a man in prison. You You got a runaway slave who ought to be in prison. He's coming back. This guy's a thief. He's a runaway slave. He's coming back. Paul says this, 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 is, this is how the church responds. I've pastored for over 40 years, and I've pastored guys. I've seen guys. I've been into prison. I've been in the federal prison. I've been in local prison. I've stood outside waiting for kids to get out of prison with mom and dad, out of jail overnight. When mom, listen, let me tell you something. Some guy gets out of that, and he comes into the church, and all he wants is somebody just to love him and accept him. That's what all of us want. And Paul's telling this guy, I got a, I got a guy who ought to be prison. Uh, I'm sending him back to you. He's going to wonder how the fellowship is going to receive him. How do we receive people? How do we receive people in this fellowship? We've been forgiven. Guess what? We can forgive you. I've been forgiven. So I can forgive you. Now I'm going to show you this. Just close your Bibles. I want you to see this. August 4th, 1993 was an unbelievable night in baseball. Texas Rangers 
Chicago White Sox, some of y'all already know, it's 29th anniversary this month. Nolan Ryan beating the soup. That old man, Nolan Ryan, up in his 40s, beating the soup out of Robin Ventura. Young guy right there. You see? Robin Ventura charged the plate. Nolan Ryan hit him. He got his base. On his way to first base, he turns and he runs out to the mound. And he finds out you don't want to mess with Nolan Ryan. That's one of the most famous pictures in baseball. What you don't know is that Robin Ventura, before they went out to the game, spoke to the United States of America Junior Olympic baseball team. We were living in Dallas at the time. The, the Junior Olympic baseball team was over in Tyler, Texas, drove two hours over to go to the baseball game. Ventura had played for the American Olympic team back, you know, in his day. He had played for them. And so they went in and said, listen, the guys from the Junior uh, Olympic baseball team are here to the game tonight. Would you come out and speak to them since you played for the Olympic baseball team back in the day? Uh, Robin Ventura came out and spoke that night <laughs> to the Junior Olympic baseball team about sportsmanship. <laughs> and then he said, let me just demonstrate to you what it's not. And that happens in the game that night. Well, they're grown men, and they can't seem to handle any of this. But this past week, Little League Baseball, getting ready for the Little League World Series. Right there, go ahead. There's Isaiah, got hit in the head. There's Shelton right there who hit him in the head. They get him up. That must have hurt. 12-year-olds, shake it off. Go ahead. Life gets worse than this, buddy. Um, <laughs> take your base. He goes to the base. You know, everybody, it's all right. Come on. There you go one more time. Wham, right there. That hurts. Now, the pitcher is crying. He's down on the ground. You can't see him, but he's crying. Here comes old Isaiah over to Shelton. Is he going to jump up, put him in the headlock, start pounding his head? There he goes right there. Twelve-year-olds. I want you to listen to what Isaiah from Oklahoma said to Shelton from Pearland, Texas. I wanted to go over there and spread some of God's love and make sure that he was okay, make sure that he knows I'm okay and that it'll all be okay. <laughs> hey, he said to him, Shelton said to the pitcher, you're doing great. He said, I cared for him. And when he asked about Isaiah's hug, he said, I also cared about him. And that just showed that baseball is all about sportsmanship. There are 12-year-olds, 12-year-olds doing what 30- and 40-year-olds have not figured out. And that is, we are to be forgiving. Let's stand. Now, I have no idea what the Holy Spirit's saying to your heart. Some of you here this morning need to come to Jesus Christ and receive that forgiveness. You've thought about it. You've toyed with it. You've contemplated it before. You know it's the great need of your life. You need to come to a God who is actually a God of forgiveness, who will forgive you all your sins. In fact, he's already gone to the cross for you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's an amazing thought to me. He doesn't wait until we come to actually pay for our sins. He's already paid for your sins. He's simply waiting for you to come and receive his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy and his love. It's up to you. Don't let anybody fool you that it's up to somebody else. It's up for you to do. You'll be held accountable for that one day. Did I respond? Did I not respond? This is the opportunity I'm giving you right now. Come to Jesus Christ. Right there where you are, pray to give your life to him. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Thank him for coming and going to a cross for you. Thank him for dying for you. But acknowledge in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And that right now, if you'll trust him, he'll forgive you all of your sin. Not most of it. He'll forgive you all of your sin. But for so many of us here this morning, listen, we harbor an unforgiveness towards someone. 
And the desire of God is for us to tap into what he's already put in us. You're able to forgive. If you're not able to forgive, listen, the issue is this. You either don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or you're hindering and quenching the Holy Spirit in your life. I don't think any one of us want to be responsible for that. Why not come to the altar? Get on your knees before God. You say, well, somebody will know, somebody will see. Listen, somebody already knows, and his name is Almighty God. It's God you need to please, and not other church people, not a pastor, not teachers. It's God. Father, this just lays us bare before you. We are all people who are desperately in need of forgiveness. And Father, for many of us, we are people who need to give forgiveness, extend forgiveness. We are people who need to be willing to ask for forgiveness. Oh, Father, help us to understand that that is a key to revival. A revival in our hearts and in our lives and in our homes. We will be set free from the prison, from the bars that hold us in. The bars of unforgiveness. We'll be a witness for you. I pray this, Father, pleading, Lord, for this congregation, for my own life, that our response would be, pleasing to you. For I pray it in Jesus' name. Would you come as God speaks? Some are already here. Would you come? Others? You just begin to slip out. You come. Make your way here. Get to the altar. Come to me. I'll pray with you. Whatever it is God's calling you to do, do it now.